برای توی کوچه رخ زیدن برای ترسیدن به وقت بوسیدن برای خواهرم خواهرت خواهرامون برای تغییر مغز ها که پوسیدن برای شرمندگی برای بی پولی برای حسرت یک زندگی معمولی برای کودک زبال گرد و آرزوهاش برای برای این هوای آلوده برای ولی از رو درخت های فرسوده برای پیروز و احتمال انقرازش برای سگ های بیگناه ممنوعه برای گریه های بیوخفه برای تصویر تکرار این لحظه برای چهره ای که میخنده برای دانش آموزا برای هاینده برای باری برای نخبه های زندانی برای کودکان افغانی برای این همه برای غیر تکراری برای این همه شعار های تو خالی برای آوار خونه های پوشالی برای احساس آرامش برای خرشی پس از شبای طولانی برای غرصای حساب و بیخوابی برای مرد میهن آبادی برای دختری که آرزو داشت به سر بود برای زن زندگی آزادی You have just witnessed a video we received from inside Iran of the continuing protests, which are in their 48th day. The protesters, Iranian women and men, are raising their voices for women, life, and freedom. Welcome to this program, Standing with the Women of Iran. I'm Alain Verveer and I direct the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. On October the 16th, Masa Amini, a 22 year old student, died after being detained by the morality police for allegedly wearing her hijab improperly. This yet another horrific example of the Iranian regime's violence against women and its campaign of gender apartheid. The mandatory hijab for women has been utilized by the government to assert its power and control over women. As we come together today, women of all generations are leading a peaceful protest movement against the Iranian regime. As you just saw in the video, they are burning their headscarves, marching in the streets across Iran and risking their lives for freedom. As one Iranian told us, every day and night in all the cities of Iran, government police officers and undercover security guards have been beating people to death, molesting women on the streets and killing many protesters with bullets. Despite the violent crackdown, there is no sign that the protests are slowing. New warnings from the head of the Revolutionary Guard in the last few days, threatening greater punitive actions have gone unheeded. Students continue to protest in large numbers at some of Iran's main universities. The Iranian women's movement has a long and rich history Iranian women have not been silent. They have courageously demanded their rights 
even collecting over a million signatures demanding equality some years ago. They've been launching online movements, speaking out against abuses and posting photos of themselves without the hijab on social media. The protests today have significant implications for the women of Iran and their rights, for the people of Iran, and for greater peace and stability in the region. None of us can afford to look away. Today, we will hear from several foremost leaders of the women's movement who are directly in touch with women on the ground. But before we turn to our esteemed panel, we will hear from Puran Nazemi, a very brave civil and human rights leader on the front lines of the movement. She is delivering this message to us from inside Iran. با درود به حضار محترم خوشحالم که در خدمتون هستم من پوران نازمی هستم از ایران با شما صحبت میکنم از میان کوچه و خیابون های پر از بوی باروت و گاز اشکاور از میان و کوچه خیابون هایی که به میدون جنگ تبدیل شده اما میدان جنگی نابرابر از من خواستن در پنج دقیقه آنچه که در ایران جریان دارن رو برای شما بگم میتونین تصور بکنید صبح که از خونه میخواییم بریم بیرون باید به بچه تون یاد بدین در مدرسه نگیدی شب خونمون چی خوردیم چی حرف زدیم نگی ماهواره داریم نگی آواز گوش کردیم نگی موسیقی شنیدیم آیا هیچ وقت مجبورتون کردن در مدرسه در دانشگاه یا هر جایی ساعت ها بنشینین و به یک حکایت 1400 ساله گوش کنید آیا مجبورتون کردن روزی چندین بار وایسید به زبانی که نمیفهمید نماز بخونید آیا هیچ وقت بهتون گفتن شما در دینتون برتر از دیگران هستید یا بدتر اینها از روزی که آمدن بین همه ما اختلاف انداختن بین زن و مرد آیا میدونید اگر یک زن بهش تعرض بشه و بر شکایت بکنه شهادتش قبول نیست باید یک مرد حتما بگه آیا میدونید اگر یک زن رو اینجا بکشن به اندازه نصف یک مرد ارزششه خیلی چیزا هست خیلی سختی ها دیدیم اما الان بچه های ما در فضای مجازی یاد گرفتن با بچه های شما یکسانن یاد گرفتن برابری یعنی چی؟ فهمیدن که لیاقتشون استعدادشون به اندازه همه در دنیاست و به دنبال به دست آوردن حقشون به خیابون اومدن به دنبال آزادی به دنبال یک زندگی آرام نمیدونم آیا کلیپ های لحظه های جون دادن بچه های ما رو دیدین؟ آیا دیدین چه جوری با باتوم ها بچه های ما رو در خیابون ها کتک میزنن؟ آیا عکس های نیکار دیدید؟ نمیخوام نمیخوام الان خیلی متاثرتون بکنم میدونم همه تون این اخبار رو دنبال کردید ممنونتون هستم که وقت میذارید و ما رو حمایت میکنید اما الان میخوام بگم خواهش میکنم دانش آموزان ما بچه های هفت ساله تا 20 ساله ما تحت بدترین شرایط هستن در کوچه و خیابون میکشنشون در مدرسه ها مدرسه به مدرسه اینها میرن و هر کسی رو ببینن که گفته زن زندگی آزادی بازداشت میکنن بسیاری از بچه های ما رو با تهمت های واهی به زندان های طویل المدت محکوم میکنن اجازه ندین این اتفاقا بیفته خواهش میکنم از سیاست مدارا بخواین از مسئولین حکومت ها و دولت ها بخواین یک اقدام عملی و بازدارنده انجام بدن And now we will turn to our panel discussion, but before we do, I just want to note uh, that at the conclusion of the program, we'll take questions uh, from all of you in our audience. Many of you have already submitted, uh, pre-submitted questions, but for those of you who have not or have another question, you can submit it through the Q&A feature on your computer. Uh, and just tell us your name and affiliation. 
And now I'll turn to Dr. Azar Nafisi, a critically acclaimed author known best for her most famous work and all-time bestseller, Reading Lolita in Tehran, which has been translated into 32 languages. She's recently written a new volume called Read Dangerously, The Subversive Power of Literature in Troubled Times. Azar has written extensively on the political implications of literature and culture, as well as on the human rights of Iranian women and girls and the important role they play in advancing freedom and democracy in Iran. She's taught at the University of Tehran, the Free Islamic University, and directed since coming to the United States, the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, SAIS, its dialogue, project, and cultural conversations. And I might add, she was a Georgetown School of Foreign Service Centennial Fellow. Born in Tehran, she came to the United States in 1997. Azar, it's always so wonderful to have you with us. Uh, and I wonder if I can begin by asking you uh, to situate the current crisis uh, in the history of the Iranian women's movement. How, how did Iran arrive at this moment today? Uh, are the students and the protests writ large different from what we've seen in the past? Uh, will they shape uh, the equality and democracy and human rights potential of Iran? We look forward to hearing from you. Dr. Nafisi, Azar, can you please press unmute? Okay. Perfect. Amy, thank you so much, Melan, for um, this lovely introduction and for inviting me to share the panel uh, with two wonderful, wonderful, amazing women. Um, you know, when I first uh, heard about the uprising and the protests in Iran, I thought, oh my God, this was the moment I was waiting for ever since I was expelled from the University of Tehran for not wearing my hijab. And now here they are, my children and grandchildren going and uh, fighting the fight for uh, freedom that we dreamt of. Uh, you asked about um, locating the present um, uh, struggles of Iranian women and Iranian people in general uh, within a historical context. And I think this is very important because one of the first things a totalitarian regime does, it wants to steal your identity. It confiscates your history and rewrites it. And the Islamic Republic has done this so well that when I came, um, uh, returned to US uh, in uh, 1997, um, each time I talked about the plight of Iranian women, inevitably, somebody would get up and say, but you are talking about westernized rights and it is their culture. Uh, can you imagine what uh, this wonderful woman uh, from inside Iran talked about what that means when they talk about it's their culture. They talk about marriage at the age of nine. They talk about uh, stoning people to death. They talk about polygamy. And um, what this movement did, it um, exposed the, the big lie for once and for all, both inside Iran and abroad. Um, now, if you want to go to the history, I mean, you know, this kind of outlook says that freedom is essentially Western. That if you want freedom of choice, if you want freedom uh, of association, you are in fact being Western. Well, the history of Iranian women's struggles goes back to a time when Western women didn't have any rights. They were also thinking of getting their rights. The first woman to unveil in Iran was in 1848, Tahereh, who was the precursor of a new religion, the Baha'is, and who was a poet. 
and she took off her veil in front of her supporters saying the universal advent has arrived. And she was so popular and her message so dangerous to the reactionary clerics that at their in the instigation, um, they strangled her and threw her body into a well so that it won't become a shrine uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for the Iranian people. And ever since then, uh, throughout 20th century, Iranian women have been fighting for their rights. They were an integral part of the constitutional revolution, the first of its type in uh, Asia. Uh, uh, to and they wanted their rights and the clerics called the right of women to education is like poison that it spreads um, uh, prostitution and Khomeini talked about giving women rights as spreading prostitution uh, so mm -hmm. over the whole 20th century, Iranian women had gained such uh, um, rights that uh, were, um, that you did not even have in the West. For uh, Women had uh, um, become active in all walks of life. You had two women ministers, women in the parliament, uh, women in heavy industry, women pilots, women policemen, and the Islamic Republic tried to wipe it all out. I want to end by saying that the first targets of any totalitarian system, and in here the Islamic Republic, is always women, minorities, and culture. And the first to rise up against this regime were women, minorities, and those active in the cultural wars. March 8, 1979, Tens of thousands of Iranian women came into the streets um, against Ayatollah Khomeini's fatwa for compulsory veil. Their main slogan was, freedom is neither Eastern nor Western, freedom is global. Now their children and their children's children are um, actualizing that slogan, linking it to woman, woman Oh my God, woman, life, freedom. freedom. Woman, life, freedom. I think this is a moment when everyone is allowed to cry. And uh, I want to end by saying that I'm so outraged and angered by the violence and brutality of the regime. And I'm so hopeful and elated by the the heroic struggle of the Iranian women and the Iranian people. We celebrate you. Thank you. Thank you, Azar. We'll come back to you. And, and thank you for giving us that perspective of, of the long struggle uh, of the Iranian women and um, the current situation that they find themselves in at this very uh, significant moment. We're gonna turn now to Masi Alina Jad, a trailblazing author, women's rights activist and journalist. Masi was driven into exile 13 years ago. And since she has helped to mobilize Iranian women through her social media sites that number some 10 million women, mostly in Iran, her leadership in defying the Iranian regime's repression and, and advancing human rights has been in many ways unparalleled. She launched her Stealthy Freedom campaign on Facebook against the compulsory hijab laws that have been used by the Iranian regime to control women. And as the New Yorker explained her impact, Millions have been able to witness the bravery of their fellow citizens and to see how widely their views are shared, which would otherwise be impossible in Iran. Women can film their harassers and abusers, send it to Masi, and millions will see it. In her book, Wind in My Hair, she describes her fight for freedom in modern Iran. The Iranian regime has tried to silence her by arresting family, trying to both kidnap and kill her 
in New York. Uh, and she and her husband have had to move into a, a FBI safe house as a result. Masi, it's so good to see you again. And it's so good to have you with us, particularly at this time. You founded this campaign against the compulsory hijab back in 2014. And in many ways you have been leading uh, the largest civil di disobedience movement in the history of the Islamic Republic with millions in Iran in touch with you on social media. So in many ways, you probably have a better understanding of what's happening there than most. And certainly you're more likely to know more about how the women are feeling uh, than most because so many are in touch with you uh, every day. So what is your observation of what's happening there today? What can you tell us? And what are the women sharing with you? Um, how are they organizing? And how is this different? Um, Azar mentioned the previous protest. How, if at all, is this different? You're, we can't hear you. It is a real honor for me. I'm very pleased being with you, Milan, with you, Azar, with you, Suzanne, clearly for not ignoring Iranian women. From the beginning when I launched my campaign, three of you, you knew that it's not about me. It's about millions of Iranian women trying to send a clear message to the rest of the world that when we are fighting against compulsory hijab, we are fighting against one of the most important pillar of religious dictatorship and hear us. I wanna actually um, give you one example that why this fight was serious and ignoring this fight actually putting Iranian women in danger. The situation of uh, Iranian women for years and years, as you know, where we were we've been counted like second class citizens, but all the time when we call on the Western country to recognize our fight, they've been saying as Azar Nafisi uh, beautifully said, it's part of your culture and we don't wanna touch it, which was an insult to a nation by calling a barbaric law part of our nation. But right now that you, we are all together here, the woman from inside Iran gave you a better picture of this uh, barbaric laws and barbaric regime, she got arrested. She is in prison. Turan Nazemi is no longer with us. And her situation is very, very bad because she's suffering from, from different, uh, you know, she, I don't wanna actually victimize her because she always tried to say that, do not victimize us while we are like warriors. We are fighting for our right to recognize us. So this situation that you see, the revolution being led by women, by many of us, have, we, we have predicted this. Azar, many years before me, many activists who actually left Iran years ago, they predicted that th there is going to be a revolution led by women. I myself at Stanford University three years ago gave a talk, which the title of my talk was, the next revolution will be led by women. So why I'm trying to actually now pointing out, instead of giving you a better picture about what Iranian women feel, I'm directing and uh, actually pointing out about the situation of Western women and their attitude and their position, because Iranian did everything. They're getting killed right now. Teenagers are getting killed in the streets. And I am sure that the whole world know this, that this is different, because this is the first time in the history that the Iranian women are burning headscarves in large number across the country. This is the first time that it's not happening in big cities. This is the first time that we see sense of unity among actresses, well-known athletes and ordinary people. This is the first time that we see schoolgirls by knowing that they might get killed. They go towards security forces and they say, we are ready to die, but we're not gonna go back home. We're not gonna live with humiliation. So the whole world know that this time is different. The Iranian, let me be very honest with you, the Iranian uh, people are not gonna win this battle if still the Western countries count this like, uh, okay, this is just a 
pro protest as part of their culture or they have to deal with themselves. And instead by supporting them saying that we don't wanna interfere, let Iranian bring democracy within the society. This is very clear that the Iranian can bring democracy themselves. They can sub save themselves. But at the same time, we still don't see um, strong action by Western government. Right now, solidarity is beautiful. We see many actresses around the globe. We see a, a lot of politicians, they try to cut their hair, showing their solidarity, but that's not enough. People like Quran Nazami came here with a clear message. Don't cut your hair, cut your ties with these murderers. I want to actually uh, tell you that when Iranian regime cut off the internet, it's very clear that what they want to do, they want the rest of the world, actually they want to prevent the rest of the world to understand uh, the brutality of the regime and the number of the killings. But it's still the young generation, they know how, how to bypass the, the, the filtering and they still, this is a punishable crime by sending videos to outside Iran. They doing this because they want the rest of the world to recognize this revolution. I know this is not gonna happen overnight. This is a marathon. We have a really tough way of it, but this is the beginning of the end. Four years ago, Milan, when you invited me to talk about White Wednesdays, you remember I named the people. I said Sabah or Dafshari. I said Ya Saman Aryani, and I asked people to name them. They are still in prison with their mothers. The world did nothing. Instead, many female politicians, well-known female politicians, well-known feminists, went to Iran. They obeyed compulsory hijab laws in front of the same oppressive regime by saying that this is the law of the land and we have to respect the law of the land. But it was not just inside Iran. The same feminists and female politicians obeyed compulsory hijab in Norway, in America, to meet with Taliban. That is why, as Azar said, this is the right time to be angry, to cry. But to be honest, I cry every day, but I want to show my anger to all those female politicians who launched campaign, brings our, bring our girls back, where are they? I wanna show my anger to all those Western feminists who launched my body, my choice, women's march in the West, where are they? I wanna show my anger to all those Western female politicians who wore hijab to celebrate hijab day, where are they? We don't need empty words. Teenagers, schoolgirls are getting killed. And by forcing women to cover themselves, actually they try to victimize them, but Iranian women trying to send a message that we are warriors. We are calling on the rest of the world to have international women's march to support us and to cut your ties with these murderers. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you understand my anger from the beginning. Instead of giving you a picture of what's going on in Iran, I thought that we have to actually have a better picture that what's going on in the West. And we still don't see like strong statement by the leaders of democratic countries. We still don't see that all the well-known Western feminists get together and ask for one day international women's march for Iranian women who are getting killed. This is one of the most historical revolution being led by women and women across the globe must call democratic leaders to take action. This is all Iranian people need now. Thanks, Masi. And, and you know, your call for action, uh, for solidarity with the women of Iran, uh, you certainly bring so much leadership and passion and experience to all of this. So hopefully more will heed you. Uh, we're going to turn now to Suzanne Maloney. Uh, Dr. Suzanne Maloney, is the vice president and director of the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution, uh, where she also leads research focused on Iran uh, and Persian Gulf energy. She's a leading voice on US policy toward Iran and the broader Middle East and has testified before Congress briefed policymakers engaged with government, nonprofits, private sector, and more. 
And she's also served as an advisor on Iran policy during the Obama administration and as a member of Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice's policy planning staff. In other words, she has worked with administrations, both Republican and Democrat. And she's authored and edited three books on Iran, the most recent, The Iranian Revolution at 40. Suzanne, thank you too for being with us and for bringing your perspective uh, to the situation that Iran currently finds itself in. Help us to understand um, from your perspective, uh, the stakes today for Iran and the broader geopolitical considerations. What does this uh, current crisis mean for the future of peace and democracy in Iran? I know that you've called for a new approach. Can you share that, uh, what you mean by that new approach with us? Thanks so much, Milan. I'm really just so honored to be part of this conversation with um, such esteemed voices, people who've uh, played such important roles in bringing the situation uh, within Iran um, to the wider world. And so um, I want to start just by echoing what both Azar and, and uh, Masi have had to say about what we're witnessing on the ground in Iran today. I think that it's really important to note I come not as an activist, but as an analyst someone who spent a career studying Iran and had the opportunity to study in Iran at, a, at an earlier stage of my career. And I can assure you that what we're seeing today is truly unprecedented. It is historic. And as Masi just said, I believe what we're witnessing is the beginning of the end of the Islamic Republic. The difficult part, is, as Masi acknowledged, is that the trajectory remains very uncertain. Um, but we here in Washington and the rest of the world must begin to do what uh, a, a former U.S. ambassador once called upon in a prior era, to begin thinking the unthinkable. How does Iran shift from this ossifying malevolent theocracy to a government that represents the aspirations of its diverse, sophisticated, globalized, and often very liberal citizenry? We see these people on the streets, um, and this is very much an amalgamation of various strands of protests that have ar arisen in Iran over the course of the past four decades. I know that many in Washington look at, at uh, moments of protest in the Middle East with a little bit of a cynical eye. We've been there, done that before. We've been disappointed before. Nobody understands that better than Iranians. They lived through a revolution that was fought on behalf of independence and freedom. And what they found in, in the aftermath was an Islamic Republic, a, a theocracy that imposed its will on the people rather than listening to the will of the people. Um, and yet these Iranians are willing to go out day in, day out across the country um, not in the numbers that we've seen in some prior instances of large eruptions, but with a persistence that has never occurred uh, in the modern history of the Islamic Republic. And so I think we have to recognize that we're that we're in a historic moment, that all of our previous assumptions and this, you know, sort of conventional wisdom that Iran was evolving and, and reforming from within, a conventional wisdom that frankly I bought into for much of my career as well, is no longer applicable. Um, the Irani, the Islamic Republic is uh, in its uh, final throes, and I think we have to begin adjusting to that assumption. Understanding where this comes from in terms of, uh, you know, the past history of Iran is important, that there was this sense uh, at least 20 years ago that there might be some possibility of change from within, and that that was always a little bit of, of the the way that the, the tensions within Iran were managed, that there was a sense that people might be able to reform the system. I think it's been very clear for at least de a decade and probably much longer that that simply isn't going to happen. Um, and it's not going to happen with the leadership that is in place within Iran today. So there is this kind of slow motion metastasis that has been going on within Iran for a number of years, and it has burst onto the streets in a very powerful way over the course of the past 48 days. In terms of what it means for the United States, let's take a step back and recognize that the Biden administration just released its national security strategy. It's one that calls for a better future of a free, open, secure, and prosperous world. It's, it states that Americans will support human rights and stand in solidarity beyond with those beyond our shores who seek freedom and dignity. And it also identifies the most pressing challenge 
facing this vision of a, of a free, open, secure, and prosperous world as those powers that are not just authoritarian, but that are engaged in a dangerous expansionist foreign policy. It describes Iran perfectly. Um, this is the central challenge. It's not just Russia. It's not just China. It is very much uh, the, the sort of system that we have in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And I think that it's going to be very important for the Biden administration to recognize that having come into office with a focus on, as all of its predecessors had, on the nuclear issue, that uh, with a desire to try to reconstitute the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the 2015 nuclear deal that the Trump administration walked away from, um, that in effect, the terms of the, of, of the challenge have changed. Iran is not a nuclear issue. It was perfectly understandable that the Biden administration wanted to bring this agreement back into compliance, simply to avoid another crisis at a time when we have other big foreign policy challenges. But what we're witnessing in Iran, not just from what's happening in the streets, but what the government itself is doing in terms of providing uh, drones to the Russians uh, as part of their combat operations in Ukraine. Iran today is the only country in the world that is providing combat support, direct material assistance to the Russian war effort in Ukraine. This is not a government that we're going to be able to uh, achieve a stable uh, rapprochement, uh, even on a discrete issue like the nuclear issue. And I think that as difficult and challenging as it will be, we have to adjust our approach and recognize that the human rights situation and uh, is, is a high priority that we have to be mobilizing all the instruments of national power to try to advance what is already happening on the streets of Iran, a process of change underway from the Iranian people. Suzanne, thanks so much for that. Extremely helpful to have that broader perspective uh, of uh, Iran's actions, uh, not just within the country, but what they're doing beyond. Uh, before we turn to the audience questions, I'd like to ask each of you uh, the same question. And it's really about how do we uh, see the way forward uh, for Iran um, from where each of you sits, from your experiences, uh, from what you know. Many are asking today what they can do. Um, certainly it's individuals as well. It's a question I get all the time but also what can the international community uh, constructively do at this time uh, to support the protest movement and what it represents? So Azar, let's go back, start with you, and then to Masi and back to you, Suzanne, uh, and then we'll turn to our audience. Well, Milan, um, one of the things, uh, one of my experiences when I was living in the Islamic Republic of Iran, was how the government tried to tell you that you're alone, tried to isolate you from the world. So um, when you are in that situation, it is so important to know that there are those ears that are listening to your voice and they can become your voice. So that is very, very important right now as we move on. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't seen much of that um, in US, for example, and Masih was right. I mean, to ask the question uh, from all these uh, groups that are fighting for uh, human rights. When George Floyd was um, um, murdered, uh, the whole world uh, uh, rose up in uh, solidarity. And I wanted to say that this solidarity uh, with the movement inside Iran or with Ukraine um, is not out of philanthropy. Um, obviously, it, uh, um, uh, uh, it is compassionate. I mean, we need that compassion. We need that connectivity. Uh, but at the same time, freedom in Ukraine or in Iran means freedom in America. So it is also pragmatic. Human rights is pragmatic. And so what we need on a whole is to become the voice of the Iranian people, um, uh, as happened during the apartheid uh, in uh, South Africa, for example. We need that kind of support. Um, but uh, very briefly, um, there are many other things that can be done. Uh, the democratic uh, countries can uh, recall uh, their um, uh, ambassadors uh, from Iran. Uh, Susan gave us a good uh, context for how to go about uh, bringing this to the attention uh, of the 
American government and the American people. Um, uh, you can freeze the assets of the officials and their families here. You can expel them. Um, uh, but one thing that I wanted to talk about was this um, um, statement given by about 43 uh, NGOs and human rights activists for UN uh, and I read from there to, to be brief, uh, should establish a, a special session, emergency session regarding Iran, and establish an independent investigative reporting and accountability mechanism. I think accountability right now um, is very important both to the Iranian people and uh, to the regime. Thank you. Masi? Mm, I think as I mentioned, uh, and, and Suzanne as well, what we need, but apart from uh, everything that I'm gonna actually name it as well, we really need determination among leaders, among activists, among uh, individuals outside Iran. Uh, I want them to be as determined as Iranians, as women of Afghanistan, then they can do a lot. First of all, as I said that, um, we really need to see this as a revolution against a gender apartheid regime. And we have to be part of it because Iranian women are not actually trying to protect just themselves, to save themselves. The Islamic Republic is one of the most dangerous regime. Sending drones to Putin to kill innocent Ukrainians. So it means that Iranian regime is committing war crime. So the whole world must address the Islamic Republic the same way that they address Putin. How come New York Times and many uh, media in the West, they do an investigation about the relative of Putin and Kremlin, that how they live here, whether they do money laundering, whether they bring money out of uh, Russia to the West, they are trying to rightfully investigate about the family members and relative of Putin. But when it comes to the Islamic Republic, they're more than welcome to go to media. Masume Iftikhar is a regular guest at CNN. Iftikhar was the spokesperson during the hostage crisis. So still in the West, we see, we, we see that people are hesitating because they're sometimes coming with the argument of white savior complex, or as Azar mentioned, their culture, or we don't want to interfere. We have to actually educate ourselves in the West that this is a revolution to protect democracy from autocracy, to protect America, to protect Western countries from terrorist regime, from warmongers, Putin, Maduro, Khamenei, uh, many like, dictators. They are more united than democratic countries. This is missing here. Otherwise, Iranian people, they are actually trying to uh, send this message that whether the democratic countries take action or not, we will get rid of this regime. We will. We all know that. But at the end, it's shocking. It's shocking that we can take step, important step, but it still is missing. It has been 50 days people are getting killed, but still we see empty words. Recall their ambassadors. The West must do it as soon as possible. They have to kick out the Iranian officials, Iranian diplomats from the Western countries as soon as possible. They have to remove the Islamic Republic from women, top women's body at the United Nations, which is a joke. This is an insult to women who are getting killed for showing their hair. But the Islamic Republic has a top seat at the United Nations to monitor women's rights globally. I mean, just repeat this to yourself. The situation in Iran, it's like, the handmaid's tail. The people in the West, they eat their popcorn, sitting and watching handmaid's tail, you know, a series like uh, entertainment. But this entertainment, this fiction is our life, is our daily life in Iran. So that is why I strongly believe that if the West understand that what happened in Vegas is gonna stay in Vegas, but what happened in Iran, in the Middle East is not gonna stay there, it's gonna hurt democracy, it's gonna hurt Western countries, then they take serious action, they take strong action. Otherwise we just you know, go to different conference, I go to different media, I cry every day, but it's still people 
just talk and talk and talk. But inside Iran, people just get killed and killed and killed. That's what is missing here. And I'm still, I want to say that President Obama said, you know, he made an apology. Clearly, he said that regret that I didn't support green movement. But that's not enough. President Biden and Western countries must kick out all those lobbies because Putin, Khamenei, Maduro, they know how to have their own apologies, their own uh, lobbyists outside Iran to sell their narratives to Western media. They have their selling their narrative to academia, to media, to human rights organizations. They got that close to Obama's administration and they are close to Biden administration as well. So for years and years, I've been labeled being warmonger. Why? Because I was uh, telling the Western country that uh, boycott Iran, kick out the Islamic Republic from all international football federations. People were labeling me that you are, also you either want war, you want Iran to be isolated, you support sanction. No, it's clear. I'm fighting against one of the most warmonger, dangerous evil. And the same narrative, the same people who were labeling us as an activist that you're warmonger, those were the one on media, close to Obama's administration and now to Biden administration and supporting uh, the warmongers regime, calling Wassem Soleimani a hero, calling Ibrahim Raisi, uh, uh, Hassan Rouhani a reformist. They're all like a bunch of butchers, killers. And they are beyond, we people of Iran are beyond reform. I want the Western country, every individual of you, students, especially young students, don't be scared. Don't be scared of being labeled a warmonger or Islamophobic. Believe me, women who I am in touch with them, they're telling me that they have the right to be scared of one of the most barbaric regime and the mullahs. We have the right to be scared of this regime who actually coming after people in, in the West. Right now that I'm talking to you, US citizen, a UK citizen, German citizen, a French citizen, Swedish citizen, they're all in Iranian prison and they're being used like bargaining chips. So it's not just Iranian people. The taking hostage, killing, murdering is in the DNA of the Islamic Republic. And Islamic Republic is like an ISIS in power. The only difference between ISIS and Iran, Islamic Republic is they can come to United Nations. They're being given visa by the US government. They're welcome to go to EU. This is the only difference. So if you recognize our fight against ISIS, then you can do a lot because then you feel the danger. And then you know that if you don't support our fight, Iranian women's fight, women of Afghanistan fights against Taliban, ISIS, Islamic Republic, then you have to face them on the US soil, on the Western countries. That's all I can say. Well, that's a great deal, Masi. So thank you for that. And let's now go to Suzanne. I'll try to build on um, what both Azar and Masi have already pointed to, which are some discrete actions that the United States and other governments can take around sanctioning those individuals associated with the crackdown, as well as the broader network of oligarchs and regime connected individuals um, who often do have um, free access to uh, you know, sort of a, a different lifestyle in the West, even as they participate and contribute to the crackdown and repression of Iranians in their own country. Um, there are certainly things that we can do, and, and I've seen the, the US government already making these strides to provide greater access to the technology that Iranians need to communicate with one another and with the world. That's a, 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 a critical challenge because as, as has already been discussed, you know, it has been um, the, the demonstration effect of these videos that, that preceded these protests of women even years ago beginning to challenge the compulsory hijab laws that inspired other women to take actions of civil, a movement of civil disobedience that has evolved and will continue, but only if people are able to coordinate with one another and only if they're able to continue to recognize that this is happening beyond their own immediate neighborhood. So those are very important. 
Obviously, the um, statements on behalf of the Iranian people from the White House, from other senior officials, and the consistency of that, the real deep engagement on the part of American and other officials um, is, is vitally important because, again, it, it helps to inspire those and, and ensure that those who are taking the greatest risks to their lives and livelihood understand that the world is watching and that the world is going to hold the Iranian system accountable for its repression of its own people. Um, ultimately, I think, you know, this is a movement that was begun by the Iranian people. It will be sustained and, and achieved by the Iranian people, not by outside forces. Um, but there is much that the, the world can do to ensure that the spotlight remains on that movement and that, that uh, at, particularly as we see this move from mere protest to what we uh, can anticipate in terms of language and, and, and some of those statements coming out of Iran, the potential for strikes, for sabotage, for cyber attacks against uh, the key nodes of Iranian power, such as the central bank, uh, and the state broadcasting authority, these have already occurred. And as this happens, a movement will arise, but ultimately the leadership has to come from within Iran. I think what's most important for governments to do is really to change the mindset. There has been, I think, as I said, this just you know laser-like focus on the JCPOA and the nuclear issue because it does present the most urgent challenge to um, near-term stability and and the potential for conflict in the region. That's that's not irrelevant, but it cannot be the only focus. It cannot even be the main focus any longer because we see the the world changing. If we could go back in time in the mid 1970s, and if American and other officials had recognized the depth of the challenge facing the Pahlavi monarchy, I can assure you that we would have done things very differently than we did. We did not appreciate what was happening. Now is the time to recognize that things are the the ground is shifting in Iran, as at least one German government official has said. It cannot be business as usual. Um, finally, for the, all those who want to be able to support the Iranian people individually. Again, there are organizations that you can contribute to that are doing good work and trying to ensure that internet access and other critical needs for Iranians uh, are available. Um, but I do think just the awareness and, and maintaining the interest and engagement, you know, as I travel around the country in small towns from, from, from east to west coast, you see Ukrainian flags flying everywhere. Yes. People care, people are, are interested and, determined to sustain that support. I think that, you know, it, it's very important that we see the continuing interest and, and caring of the American public and those publics uh, in the West as well, because that helps to drive political choices uh, of our leadership. Well, this has been so rich and I know it will continue to be as we uh, entertain now the questions uh, from uh, our listeners today. So I'm gonna turn to my colleague, uh, Allie, to uh, help us start with the questions, please. Thanks, Milan. I'm going to ask a couple at a time because we do have so many. So for our speakers, please just indicate if you'd like to answer. Um, the first one is a question from a former student of Ostad Akbari for Dr. Nafisi. Can you please stop, talk specifically about student and youth activism that you have also described in reading Lolita in Tehran? How is that kind of activism instrumental and what can the international community be doing to amplify the voices of Iranian students? And a second question here asking specifically about the role of foundations, nonprofits, other donors. Beyond policy, what types of interventions or programs are most constructive to support the protest movement? Uh, Azar, let's start with you on the specific question about the students. Uh, and then beyond uh, for whoever else is interested. Azar? Well, you know, I, I keep um, telling people that uh, this fight the women are um, uh, carrying out in Iran, and as Suzanne said, um, it goes back to the beginning of uh, the revolution. Women were the first group to come out. Uh, is not merely political. Uh, it is existential. Um, I mean, the government has targeted not just our political ideas, but the way we look, the way we walk, the way we talk, whom we talk with, how we talk, with, uh, how we feel. Um, all of these are, are regulated. The regime has tried to regulate. And therefore, from the very beginning and at the time when I was in Iran, um, I felt that we were fighting for our sense of dignity and identity. And that is why there are so many 
groups and people uh, who are involved in this fight. It is not a political fight. If it were a political fight, as the regime has done, uh, they would put the leaders of the organizations in jail or kill them and, um, and all their organizations. But what are they going to do with millions of young girls who come into the streets of Tehran um, not wearing their hijab pr properly, which is what women started doing um, uh, at the very beginning. Um, not wearing it properly, not walking the way the regime wants to walk, because the regime wants you to become invisible in public. And what the women did with the hijab was become more visible in fact, in public. So they cannot put all these women in jail. They cannot kill all these women. And that was um, what I felt when I was living in Iran, uh, looking at the way uh, my students were um, not wearing their veil, were wearing makeup, um, um, holding hands uh, with their boyfriends. Uh, all of these were, uh, was telling the regime to its face that you don't own me. You have not succeeded in taking away from me my identity as a woman. And that uh, was at the time I was living there, at the time my students were living there, um, that was what we were doing. That was what women were doing. Uh, and as Melan, I think, mentioned, or Susan, um, uh, you had the one million women signature. You had a, a constant struggle uh, throughout. Uh, this struggle is different because it knows that reform is revolution that you cannot be half pregnant. You have to be, with this kind of absolutist regime, you have to be fully pregnant. And this generation has taken the legacy of the other generation, of the previous generations, and rather than preaching violence, they are preaching life. They're preaching freedom. And they are finding creative ways to stand up to this regime. And I think that is where the hope lies. Thank you. Uh, Masi or Suzanne, do you want to add um, to the question that you heard? Yeah, I mean, it's beautifully actually uh, uh, mentioned that this is a fight for our dignity, our freedom. I mean, come on, guys, this is 21st century. And it's unbelievable that we get lashes just because of wearing what we want to wear. We are being raped by the age of nine, by the age of 13, in the name of marriage. You know, we go to prison if we drink water. If we drink water during Ramadan, we get lashes. Women are in prison, 15 year old, 16 year old, just because a little bit of their hair was shown. I mean, when I repeat this, I still, still get goosebumps that this is happening. And still many people uh, hesitate to talk about it in the name of Islamophobia. In my country, in the name of uh, the law, blasphemy, we are being censored. Here we have to be brave to talk about it that we're really, we're really scared of getting lashes, getting jailed, getting killed, going to prison for just carrying our own identity, for just saying that let us be our true self or let us talk or let us to, uh, to, to, to love each other, to dance, to sing. So this is a fight against, um, one of the most barbaric regime trying to actually make us all look alike, like carrying their ideology. The only way when you go to Iran that you understand this is the Islamic country, this is the country under control of Islamic states, Islamic regime, is through us. Right after the revolution, they wrote their own ideology on our body and through women. When you go to Iran, to Afghanistan, you understand, okay, now these women are being owned by the Islamic regime. So, and here I want to use actually this uh, term that many people say that we don't want to interfere, Western countries. They say that we don't want to interfere, internal matter, let's Iranian people bring this regime down. But I want to say that while people are getting killed, 
the same people who managed to shake the regime at the same time when the Western country negotiate with the same regime, this is called interfering. When the same government are now being challenged by people, people are getting killed to say no to Islamic Republic, but the Western country tried to get, to get a deal or sending billions of dollars to the same regime, it is kind of interfering. As Azar Nafisi mentioned, this is the time that people stood with uh, South Africa during the apartheid. One question and I'm gonna leave it. Imagine it was not the women of Iran. Imagine it was women of America, women of Sweden, women of France, women of Germany, being kicked out from a stadium just because of being women. What would have been the reaction of academia? What would have been the reaction of uh, uh, media? What would have been the reaction of human rights organizations? What would have been the reaction of the whole world? They would have, well, I mean, it's clear. You don't need me to answer. But right now, for years and years, we say women are not allowed to go to a stadium, kick out the Islamic Republic. The whole world kept silent, saying that we don't want to interfere. We don't want to touch this issue. This is beyond sad that you think that we, the women of Iran, deserve to be kicked out of the stadium. We deserve to be raped from the age of 13. We deserve to be forced to cover ourselves. But when it comes to Western women, then we get together. No, this is the time. So we have to keep the sisterhood, get together, and take sight. Take sight, the sight of Iranian women who are saying no to gender apartheid regime. Thanks. Suzanne, is there, do you want to add or should we go on to further questions? I'll just make the point that, you know, this is a very young uh, de demographic that's leading the protests in many cases. Uh, statistics suggest that about 40% of those who've been detained in the latest round of, of protests are under the age of 20. Um, and this is a generation that has come of age at a time where they've seen with their own eyes that reform, despite nice words, doesn't really bring about any meaningful change to their lives. They've also had incredible access to both technology and to education. And so an incredibly talented, uh, dynamic and well-informed young population who just wants to live a normal life. And I think that, you know, the imposition of compulsory hijab is just one really uh, degrading symbol that it results in millions of women every year being stopped by security forces uh, and issued a citation or possibly brought to jail. It provide, creates this level of insecurity that affects every person and every family. And so I, I think that we have to recognize that, you know, this irrespective of, how, of whether the protests get larger or smaller, that this is going to be a, a, a huge corrosive impact uh, for the ability of the Islamic Republic to govern itself. It's a very good point. Uh, Ali, further questions? Sure, uh, two here. The first one is asking about how can the targeted sanctions and other actions to isolate Iran that you all have mentioned be implemented without further harming the Iranian people? And the second one is how do you see this movement impacting other women's rights struggles in the Middle East and MENA region? How can these movements, also including in Afghanistan, best work together? Can we start with you, Suzanne, on that? Sure, I'll just say a word about targeted sanctions. I mean, those are typically the, the, the ones that have the least impact on the broader population because they're really directed at those closest to power and trying to make a, a point of making an example of them, preventing them from having the perks of, of their uh, position. And, you know, and, and so I think that that's um, less of a concern in terms of how it affects the quality of life for ordinary Iranians. I think, in fact, it's important to demonstrate that uh, access to power in the Islamic Republic doesn't provide free access to the West as part of uh, a, a part of those perks. Um, and so I think targeted sanctions are entirely appropriate. I think we have to be realistic about um, the ability to really move this regime with those types of measures. But to be frank, most of the sanctions that are in place on Iran today are, are those issued by the United States. There really is a role for Europe uh, and other uh, industrialized countries 
those that have that uh, you know sort of signed on early in terms of pressuring Iran around the nuclear issue after 2010 in particular. Um, this is a time for Japan, South Korea, for all the countries of Europe um, and others around the world to really uh, make a point that this is not uh, Iran is not just a nuclear issue. This is uh, uh, we're watching history being made, and we all need to be on the right side of that history. Thank you. Do uh, Masi or, or uh, Azar, do you want to add anything? If not, we can go on. I want to add actually something. Look, the targeted sanction is phenomenal. But as far as the Western country do not actually follow their own uh, policy, it's not going to help. Let me just give you one example. When Ibrahim Raisi was here in uh, New York giving address at the United Nations, um, we Iranians actually found out that one of the member of Revolutionary Guards was part of the delegation. I myself actually talked about this to Jake Sullivan and he said that they're doing an investigation about it. But we were shocked that the Revolutionary Guards is on the terrorist list being sanctioned by many countries, not just the United States of America, but still Iranian regime know how to bypass these target sanction by creating like, um, art institutions, um, you know, cultural institutions, uh, and, and, and the, but, by, but, but all of these, we Iranians know the best that they are part of revolutionary guards. So they come with different names, but we know it. We don't know how to reach out to the US government and tell them, or the Canadian government, and tell them that they, this is how the Islamic Republic bypassed the target sanction. Could I say something about the impact? Yes, please. Um, I remember that in 2009, when um, there was another uprising during the Green Movement, uh, I kept saying that Iran is the Soviet Union of the Muslim world. Um, it was the first theocracy uh, uh, that uh, um, moved from a modern society into a theocracy, and it affected the whole region and the whole world. It radicalized. Radical Islam was theorized by the Islamic Republic. And now this movement by women and, and the Iranian people um, is the first movement that is rising up to um, this kind of a um, of a situation. And therefore, the breakdown of the Islamic Republic, like the breakdown of the Soviet Union, uh, will have um, echoes, its echoes, uh, both in the region and around the world. Thank you. Ellie? Sure. We'll do a final round with two questions. The first question is specifically for Masi. Today, you called on Iranian opposition leaders to come together and create a transitional council. Can you speak a bit about what that would entail? And then a question here from a journalist. There are reports that no Western media outlets have been allowed to enter Iran and the regime works hard to censor news and prevent information from leaving the country. What is the best way for the international community to support Iranian journalists and independent media? Okay, starting with you, Masi, and then we'll go into the media. Look, Iranian people did their best to deliver a message that we don't want the Islamic Republic. We want an end to a gender apartheid regime. We see a sense of unity among Iranians inside, outside, between Kurds, Baluch, Turk. Like, like for years and years, the Islamic Republic tried to divide us. But now we're getting there. So that is why I reached out to many opposition leaders inside and outside Iran and I actually call on them to get united because we have to uh, have a united opposition transitional council and call on democratic countries, the leaders of free uh, countries that this is the time that you have to recognize the revolution. Clearly, we don't wanna ask them to, to save us, but we have to have a united opposition to ask the democratic countries to stop them from saving the Islamic Republic. The, I cannot talk more about this because the conversation is going now. It's, it's ongoing conversation. And I have hope that we can get united the way that the Iranian people are united and actually ask the democratic country for stronger action. Thank you. 
on the media, uh, Azar or Suzanne? I defer to Suzanne, like to hear what she said. Um, I, you know, there are some good organizations that are providing support to independent and citizen journalism from Iran. Um, one of them is uh, an organization called Iran Wire, which is led by Maziar Bahari, who was a journalist imprisoned uh, while he was uh, reporting from Iran in 2009. And they draw on uh, they pr and provide opportunities for Iranian journalists, both inside the country and those who've been forced to flee like Masi has. So I, I think that's a, it's a terrific organization. It is a great source of information. Um, and it is also, uh, I think, an important resource uh, for Iranian journalists. Obviously, you know, social media is providing a lot of opportunities for individual Iranians to to tell their own story. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I think, something that Masi actually recognized, perhaps uh, the hashtag activism, how to make it effective and useful. And it has uh, it has really obviously played an important role in these latest protests. There is a, a particular site that has been trying to collate and document all of the videos uh, of protests from around the country. And so I think following uh, 1500 Tasvir is the, the handle for that Twitter account. Uh, both in English and in Persian, is is a very valuable way to just uh, remain updated on what's happening uh, on a daily basis around the country. Thank you. I think we've got like two more minutes. Maybe we can do one more question. Ali, is there one more we can uh, raise? Sure. Uh, we'll pull on that tech thread. There's been quite a lot of questions about the role of online activism and social media. So this question asks, are there any risks of using technology as a mobilizing tool and how can the international community uh, be better mitigating that? And then uh, a second question here on what are your thoughts on social media algorithms that impact sharing? And then are there certain programs you suggest we follow? Well, Masi, let's start with you because if anybody's used social media effectively, you've certainly been able to do that. Actually, I want to use this opportunity to, to, to tell you that what we need right now, the Iranian regime banned 18 million people from using social media. But at the same time, the leaders of this regime are using social media like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. They're all filtered inside Iran and using them makes you like a you know, master criminal. So what tech company can do here they have to kick out all these murderers, you know? They're using the platform to oppress people. Just today, actually, one of the well-known rapper, too much Saleh, he got arrested. And uh, on social media, we were actually, it was very heartbreaking. We saw that the Iranian regime published a video of him while being tortured. This is how the Iranian regime using social media, but for Iranians themselves, it's dangerous to use social media. I remember that when President Trump got kicked out from Twitter, all people got, you know, celebrated in America. But it's unbelievable that now no one even touched this issue, that it has been 50 days, people are getting killed, teenagers are getting killed, uh, internet is cut off, but it's still the tech companies hesitating to kick out the, 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 the leaders of uh, Islamic Republic. And I want to say that the social media is a tool for Iranian. It's like it became like a weapon for them because this is the only way that they can actually show the rest of the world that by peacefully protesting, by peacefully walking unveiled, you're getting killed. You're getting tortured. You're getting bitten up in the street. There is a hashtag called my camera is my weapon. It's not new. For years and years, women have been showing the rest of the world that we're getting bitten up, bullied, harassed by morality police every day. So this is actually the right time if we could find a way to launch a new campaign and ask the tech companies to kick out the leaders of the Islamic Republic and ask the US government to encourage the US companies to do it and give more access uh, to, to Iranian to use internet freely. Good point. Anyone else on the uh, social media? question. Well, we'll leave it at that. I think by any measure, uh, this has been an extraordinary discussion. Uh, and I think that uh, what it should say to all of us is that while this discussion may come to an end, uh, the work must not. And in fact, it must be uh, accelerated in terms of standing 
uh, with the people of Iran at this moment. Uh, I think it's been very clear from our participants that the regime would like nothing more than to uh, continue to stress to the people of Iran, and especially the women, that they are alone, but they cannot be viewed, uh, in our view, uh, of being alone or being invisible. So standing in solidarity with them is critically important. Uh, we've heard from you so many good ideas uh, in terms of steps that be, can be taken, uh, whether with respect to the United Nations and the, um, the Commission on the Status of Women stripping Iran's seat on that, uh, whether it's an emergency session, uh, whether it's for governments to be uh, changing their mindsets in many ways, while the nuclear effort is an important one, it cannot be the only focus. Uh, as Suzanne said, the ground is shifting uh, and we must recognize uh, a greater engagement and what that represents. Um, and for each of us to know um, that there is a role for us, uh, whether uh, as a student or whether as uh, a government. Uh, and this is a time when we're all called on. And this is about what is happening in Iran, but it is also, as you pointed out, about what Iran is doing in the greater world. And Ukraine is certainly one of those examples. Uh, so much is at stake. Uh, you have articulated that so incredibly well. And I hope that this discussion uh, will be viewed as truly a call to action. Um, and before we close, I wanna thank uh, Kehan Life uh, and uh, Kehan London for being a partner with us on this event. Uh, and so many others who have uh, supported this effort. Um, we many years ago wanted to put a spotlight on women in Iran because we knew so much about what was happening to women in other parts of the world and what needed to be done. Uh, but the story of women in Iran has been one that is for lots of reasons uh, not penetrated. And I think in this moment, we need to stand with them as they are doing everything they can uh, for themselves. And as I was listening to each of you, I must say I was reminded of a conversation I had years ago at a special moment with President Mandela because you mentioned South Africa uh, and it was at his, the prison in which he spent so much of his life on Robben Island. And I said to him, President Mandela, did you know about the protests in the United States? Did you know what was happening around the world in support of the anti-apartheid movement. And he looked at me and he said, what do you think kept us going? And I think it's important now for the people in Iran and especially the women of Iran to know that they are not alone and that we stand with them and we stand in solidarity with them. So thank you, Azar. Thank you, Masi. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, you have enriched us greatly and made us a lot smarter and hopefully a lot more active on this issue. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.